joke. I don't know why I put it here. It's, it's I think it must, yeah, I must have used the, like, the first uh, transparency from some talk in another country. And then. OK, thanks so much. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I enjoyed a lot the talks so far and actually learned new things, um, which I'm discussing with people here. So it was a very productive conference thus far. Um, also, I realized I prepared a very basic talk in some way, but in this flank, I see world experts on this subject, so probably. <laughs> yeah. Also here, lots of world experts. So I, uh, I don't know, I hope somebody will benefit something from this talk, at the very least. Um, no, no, it stopped working. Why is that? Just a second. It's not working anymore. It's because, OK. I see. I have to tap. So happy birthday for a, a, the discovery of asymptotic freedom. And uh, uh, in this presentation, uh, I'm not. I'm going to cover very recent history, um, like for the last couple of years. Some works that I was involved in. Many other people in the audience were involved in related work. Uh, it's not going to be a very historical talk. I'll just explain some line of ideas that developed over the last couple of years and what they have led to thus far. So let me start. Also, if there are any questions, please stop me at any point. Um, because I, I am trying, I am going to try to explain some idea from beginning to end. So if there is something unclear, I should explain it better. Um, so physics is very oscillatory in nature. Of course, things are discovered and rediscovered and rediscovered. There are waves like that throughout history. So today we're going to talk about the implications of an idea that is uh, uh, probably almost 50, well, 45 years old. Uh, but uh, it has reappeared, and the new things were derived that uh, are undoubtedly were not known before. And actually, the first time I heard about this, uh, I, uh, the first time I realized that there is some potential in this in revitalizing these ideas and reconsidering them was from Ryan Thorngren, who is now a U UCLA faculty member. It's probably seven or eight years ago. He gave a talk about some uh, topological quantum filters, and he used the notion, uh, some notions that will be used today. Um, so, what is the, what was the point of that paper from '79? Uh, so, uh, Tuff just said uh, that there are, if you study Young Mills, Tuff said uh, back then that uh, if you study Young Mills. I'm going to talk about pure Young-Mills theory at first. If you study pure Young-Mills theory, let's say on the four torus, on the lattice, there are exotic boundary conditions uh, that they are called that they were called toft vortices, uh, sorry, uh, center vortices or uh, twisted boundary conditions. So this was the idea of this paper in '79, and uh, so a lot of recent activity is due to the fact that people have thought about this idea again in a more concrete way, and uh, we're able to derive new facts that I'll explain today. So a lot of the predictions that were derived are testable in principle, but they were not uh, confirmed yet. So this is forward looking in this sense. So let me just explain the original idea of Toft uh, via a very simple toy model, or a very simple field theory. It will be this, uh, that will be just for those who, do, who, who are not familiar with the idea of a Toft for twisted boundary conditions or for those who forgot what it is. So if you look at U1 gauge theory, I mean four dimensions, U1 gauge theory in four dimensions, and you have a bunch of particles with charges QI, which are some random integers, a, a, a fact that goes back to Dirac is that when you compute partition functions of such theories, you have to sum over magnetic fluxes. 
And the sum over the magnetic fluxes is uh, labeled by some integers. And you have to do that if you compute partition functions on tori or a sphere times a torus. And so you have to sum over the magnetic fluxes over every two cycle. It's just the way, otherwise, you're not getting the right answer. So that's the, how we compute partition functions. And now, what is the twist? The idea of Tuft was that if we somehow only discussed theories where all the charges are multiples of n, let's say multiples of 2, it would still be true that partition functions are only, in par when you compute partition functions, you need to sum over integer fluxes. And why is that? Because when we decide what is the gauge group, that dictates the fluxes. The matter fields is secondary. We first decide what's the gauge group, then we decide what are the matter fields. And once we've decided what is the gauge group, we, we have uh, already fixed the fluxes. So the fluxes over which you have to sum over, even if all the charges are multiples of n, are always the same. But intuitively, you understand that you might allow other fluxes now, because the charges are multiples of n. So the way Tuft formalized it is he said that there is a family of partition functions. So you can discuss partition functions labeled by two integers. And these integers are the fluxes through the first torus and the second torus in the case of T4. And uh, then you, you are allowed to sum over this kind of fluxes with a, with a fractional coefficient, mi over n. And uh, this labels, so this leads to new partition functions. And this is what people call Tuft, uh, Tuft fluxes or center vortices. OK, is the idea clear? So there is a family of partition functions labeled by, two, by integers. Now, in SUN Young Mills theory, in some sense, since the gluons carry charges which are 0 mod n, the same idea holds. If there are no fundamental representations, only a joint representations, let's say, the same idea holds. And therefore, there, are, there is a family of partition functions. So when people simulate on the lattice SUN Young Mills theory, there is a family of partition functions labeled by integers, which are called center vortices or Tuft fluxes. So you have to take all the two cycles in the geometry and decide what is the Tuft flux through those two cycles. So Young Mills theory has a family of partition function, family of partition functions labeled by these integers. Okay, this is the this is the old story. Are there any questions about it? And of course, lattice people have simulated this. This is not science fiction. You started from Z and then switch to Z and and the first line, right? Uh, where was Z? No, first, first line, first formula is Z. So here, these are the fluxes over which you sum. Yeah. Oh, it did uh, it again. Uh, these are. No. So these are the fluxes over which you sum. Yeah, and, and the fractional part is labeled by M, like which is in ZN. The line is the first uh, line. What? Uh, the, uh, the line where the flux equal to pi M, if M belongs to Z, not ZN. Yeah, this is the Dirac piece. Yeah, this is the, the quant Dirac quantization. Okay. The twisted boundary conditions have fractional piece to the flux, okay. a fractional piece, and an arbitrary integer piece. Right, so uh, like, big, uh, capital M is fixed by... Uh, the charges of the matter fields. So when we decide what is the gauge group, we decide what are the fluxes. But there is a second step, which is that if the charges, if the representations are, uh, let's say, only multiples of n, we can allow more general fluxes. And this defines a family of partition functions. What's the feedback? Uh, two torus. Let's say you try to do a lattice simulation on a four torus. So you decide how much flux through the first two torus and the second two torus. A two cycle is a two torus for me, OK? OK? OK. So the modern point of view says the following. What are these uh, twisted boundary conditions? We usually, in statistical mechanics or in quantum mechanics, when we encounter twisted boundary conditions, we always think about symmetries. Because how do we get twisted boundary conditions? We introduce chemical potentials. Chemical potentials are associated to U1 symmetries, right? Like in statistical mechanics. So the idea, this is what Ryan told me many years ago, and I got interested in the subject because of that, is to think about the Tuft vortices and the, and the modified fluxes as essentially arising due to a symmetry, because these are some twisted boundary conditions. So this is what people have done. They have reformulated 
the hoofed idea in terms of symmetries. But once you do that, you can get many new results that were not accessible before. So there is some uh, symmetry that is associated to the hoof flexes. People did not say it in this way in the 70s. What is this symmetry? It's what sometimes people call center symmetry. It's a weird symmetry. It's not an ordinary symmetry that acts on local operators. Because when you have statist in statistical mechanics, when you have chemical potentials, it, it's about boundary conditions on a cycle, on a circle. Here, the boundary conditions are twisted on a two cycle or a two torus, not on one circle. So therefore, these are more exotic types of symmetries. So these symmetries are not obtained by integrating a current on the whole space. It's obtained by integrating a current on a two-dimensional subspace of three-dimensional space. So these are uh, nowadays called one-form symmetries, because these are not ordinary symmetries. You integrate over a co-dimension two space rather than co-dimension one. OK, this is what's uh, called the center symmetry. And ordinary symmetries are associated to a gauge field and there is a chemical potential. But in this business, because uh, the twisted boundary conditions concern with two directions at the same time, the gauge field is not a one-form gauge field. It's a two-form gauge field. And in these examples that we discussed, it's a ZN gauge field. It's a two-form ZN gauge field. So, the system, so basically, pure young mills theory has a weird ZN symmetry. And you can couple it to a two-form gauge field. And once you activate this two-form gauge field, it's tantamount to putting toothed fluxes through the corresponding two-dimensional two torus. OK? So Toft's modified partition functions in modern terminology is nothing but turning on uh, the two-form gauge field on various two-dimensional tori. So we just reformulated what Toft did in the language of symmetries associated to a two-form gauge field. And this two-form gauge field is not science fiction again. You can, on the lattice, you can introduce it. On, so there are plaquettes, and there are the and uh, there is the thing inside the plaquette. The plaquette is associated to a two-dimensional space. So inside the plaquette, you can put another variable in lattice gauge theory, which is the two-form gauge field. So you can put, do it all on the lattice. It's extremely explicit. OK. So what's the next step? In quantum field theory, when we compute partition functions, we don't usually get completely sensible results because there are counter terms. So once you reformulated what Hoof did in terms of this two-form gauge field, you can ask, so how do we actually evaluate these partition functions where the two-form gauge field is activated? We encounter an ambiguity. And the ambiguity is that we can add a counter term on the lattice, actually, which is just the B cup B is something like B wedge B. So you take the two-form flux on one torus, the two-form flux on the other torus, and you multiply them. So this leads to a small, small ambiguity in what Hoof said which is that the partition functions are not completely well-defined. There is a small phase ambiguity, which is labeled by an integer. This is just a phase that depends on the product of the two fluxes, m1 and m2, over the two, tor two, two, two tori. OK, so there is a small phase ambiguity in the partition functions of a tooft. This is a small pedantic point, it would appear. This becomes, uh, so here is a technical comment that I'm going to skip. I just wanted, so from this slide, you might have in, the ambiguity seems to be uh, uh, labeled by an integer in Z2n, but when you actually compute it on the four torus, it's only labeled by an integer in Zn. Uh, and the technical explanation that I'm not going to go into is that it has to do with which manifolds you study. If you try to study a system on the lattice on some very exotic manifold, it will become ambiguous up to an integer in 2n, but on Tora, it's just uh, Zn. OK, so why is this a subject uh, gay interesting? It's a small ambiguity in the partition function, but why is it relevant? So there is one dimensionless coupling in young mills theory, which is the theta angle, which is defined up to 2 pi. And the, the, the main discovery in this field is that in the presence of this two-form gauge field B, there is no invariant, the partition function is not invariant under theta going to theta plus 2 pi. So ordinarily, people say that, theta, that uh, changing theta by 2 pi doesn't do anything. But in the presence of the two-form gauge field B, this is not true. And uh, partition functions get multiplied by a phase, which is uh, mathematically saying that this k, this counter term k, jumps by 1. 
So this is a rigorous fact that can be established on the lattice. That the theta to two pi, the two pi periodicity of the theta angle is violated in the presence of at hoofed vortices. Okay, so this is uh, so this is what I'm saying here. Uh, in the presence of these vortices, center vortices, or the hoofed fluxes, the partition function is not two pi periodic. The partition function rather jumps by a phase, and this leads to lots of interesting conclusions. And I'm going to now go over all the conclusions that this leads to. So the partition, the, the lack of two pi periodicity of the partition function. So one immediate conclusion is that Young-Mills vacuum cannot be gapped and confined for every theta. So if the Young-Mills vacuum was gapped and confined for every value of theta, like we believe it is for theta equals to zero, it would lead to a contradiction because then the phase would not be, it would not be possible for the phase to all of a sudden jump if the vacuum was gapped and confined for all theta. Because if the vacuum was gapped and confined, you could just change theta adiabatically and the phase couldn't jump. But since I've proven that the phase jumps, I've proven to you that the phase jumps, or I've told you that the phase jumps, it cannot be true. And furthermore, you can argue that something really special has to happen at theta equals pi. So when you try to change theta adiabatically at theta equals pi, you encounter some new physics. So this is a rigorous uh, conclusion about pure Young-Mills theory. Uh, uh, and now you can ask what happens at theta equals pi that would allow this jump in the phase of uh, the partition function in the presence of the hoofed vortices. So the conjecture is that at theta equals pi, pure Young-Mills theory has two vacua. We already saw some uh, sort of a hint of that in the talk of uh, Michael Kreutz who studied uh, theta equals pi in a theory with massless funda or light fundamentals, but here I'm talking about pure Young-Mills theory. In pure Young-Mills theory, we also expect that there are two vacua at theta equals pi, and presumably this is true for all SUN gauge groups above SU2. We don't know if it's true for SU2, but it's believed that for SU3, Young-Mills theory and higher, there are two vacua at theta equals pi. Um, so the constraint itself, which is that the partition function has this phase ambiguity, does not exactly tell you what happens as you vary theta. There are many scenarios you could contemplate, and in various gauge theories, different scenarios take place. Um, one thing that, mo that, we, that is believed is that at large enough n, there are two vacua at theta equals pi, and uh, for SU2, it may or may not be true. We don't know. Okay. So the, there is spontaneous breaking of time reversal symmetry in pure Young-Mills theory at theta equals pi. And it just follows from these considerations about the phase of the partition function with hoofed vortices. It's uh, completely rigorous and it holds even for SU3 or SU4 or SU2. Echo at uh, furthermore, you can make the conclusion much more striking and more, is, and more like testable and rich for the lattice to test because the fact that the phase of the partition function jumps by this counter term implies something also about the finite temperature phase diagram of pure Young-Mills theory. So I told you that the time reversal symmetry or CP symmetry is broken at theta equals pi. But of course, when you go to high enough temperatures, it's going to be restored like every symmetry is restored at high temperatures. In fact, it follows from the work of uh, Gross, uh, Pisarski, and Jaffe, that here at very high temperatures, there is no breaking of time reversal invariance. But you could ask, when is time reversal invariance restored? Is it after the de deconfinement transition or before the deconfinement transition? This is a legitimate question to ask and people have asked it on the lattice already in the 90s at least in some other variants of this theory. And this jump of the partition function in the presence of a hoofed vortices uh, settled this question. Because if the time reversal symmetry was restored at temperatures below the deconfinement transition, then it would mean that you can change theta adiabatically in a confined, gapped, non-degenerate vacuum phase, and it would be in contradiction with this fact that the counter term jumps. So therefore, there is a rigorous inequality that you can prove. It's a nice application, the topology, just the topology of the 
partition functions of young mills theory implies an actual inequality for the thermodynamics. So it implies that time reversal symmetry must be restored only after the deconfinement transition. It has not been tested, but it's a prediction. We tested this idea in holographic theories. Holographic theories is like a toy model for pure young mills theory. In holographic theories, everything I said is true. You can see the discounter term jumps and the whole story holds up. And at least at large n, the time reversal symmetry and the deconfinement temperature exactly coincide at leading order in the large n limit. I do not know if this is true in pure young mills theory in nature. It's true for these holographic toy models. And I've spent a lot of time trying to understand why this is true and I did not succeed. Certainly the inequalities should be true in pure young mills theory, but I don't know why they exactly coincide at large n. Another prediction of this uh, business is that for n equals one super young mills theory, which Igor mentioned yesterday, there is also an axial symmetry and there is a deconfinement temperature. An axial symmetry which is broken in the vacuum and restored at high temperatures, and there is a deconfinement temperature. So you can repeat the same story and you get an inequality. That the axial symmetry should be restored only after the deconfinement transition. And for this, there is some lattice evidence. This is for SU3, super young mills theory. I don't know the details of the simulation because it's a chiral theory. I don't know if they, were, if they can really simulate the massless, massless point and be sensitive to the axial restoration symmetry temperature. But this is, the claim is that they seem to be seeing this phenomenon, that this is happening uh, quite after the deconfinement transition. Okay. Are there any questions about these inequalities? The um, next thing I'm going to talk about is what happens when you look at more detail in these two vacua of pure young mills theory at eta equals pi, and you try to, co to construct the interface between them, the coexistence, the coexistence surface. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 So exactly for this reason, this is called the Haldane chain. What you're talking, the Haldane model. Heisenberg model with spin a half. Exactly. So exactly for this reason, that in condensed matter, in the in this model at spin a half. Uh, the bottom, the conclusion was that there, are, there is a massless, a gapless theory rather than two vacua. This is why I was cautious in this slide about n equals two. I'm a little worried that maybe n equals two in Young Mills theory is similar to the Haldane model, to the Heisenberg model at spin a half. That's exactly the reason that I'm cautious. If you look at this, ma at this magnet with higher values of the spin, there are two vacua. So I think this Young Mills theory is very similar to that. That's the reason I was cautious. So it's a good uh, remark. Now, I'm going to tell you some weird facts about what happens if you consider the domain well between these two, these two vacua. So we put one vacuum on one side, the other vacuum on the other side. They're both confined. Let's recall the phase diagram. Both of the vacua are uh, confined. We're talking about zero temperature. So they're here. They're both confined. So this jump in the counter term leads to a very interesting conclusion. Because this counter term that jumps when you take theta to theta plus two pi uh, is gauge invariant on the four torus or T2 times S2, but it's not gauge invariant when there is an interface. And it's also non-gauge invariant when there is a boundary. And that's a lot like the integer quantum Hall effect. You remember that in the integer quantum Hall effect there are edge modes because some term is not gauge invariant. So here you get some higher dimensional version of the quantum Hall effect. And that's very nice that it appears already in Young Mills theory. And it leads to bizarre conclusions about this domain wall. So let me just list the conclusions. First of all, the external fundamental quarks are deconfined. So while in each of the vacua the quarks are confined, if you take a Wilson loop and bring it close to the interface, it becomes perimeter law. It's not area law. So you lose confinement on the interface. Again, this was not seen on the lattice, but it should be true. And a more bizarre thing is that the external quarks become anions. So while external quarks are some heavy quarks, they could have spin a half or zero, depending if they're fermions or bosons. 
when you bring them close to the interface, they acquire fractional spin, very much like the electron. Well, uh, very much like uh, uh, there are some bizarre things happening to anions in the quantum Hall effect, and they acquire fractional spin. So something similar happens here, and this is the prediction for the spin of the quark. So in n equals three, the spin of the quark becomes one six. In the bulk, it's confined, and its spin is a half or zero. But when you bring it close to the interface, the spin becomes one six and it's deconfined. This all follows just from the jump of the counter term. And a very simple conjecture about what is the content of this interface is that it's an abelian fractional quantum hole state. So this is like a, a one-dimensional higher version of the quantum hole effect that in the young mills theory on the interface, we have an abelian quantum hole state. And all the Wilson lines are deconfined, as I said. These are just in pure young mills theory. It should be true and it should be testable. Okay, I'm just going to move to NF equals one QCD to show you applications for the one flavor to QCD. Are there any questions about pure young mills theory? Okay, so let me discuss one flavor QCD. This was already brought up in several talks. And I think the, some of the things that were said are incorrect. So I'm going to try to that's why I added it to the slides to explain what's really going on in one flavor QCD. <coughs> one very conceptually clear way to parameterize the physics of one flavor QCD is to ignore the theta angle. There is no theta angle. The physics is parameterized by a complex mass. So if you allow the quarks to have a complex mass, that's it. This is the only parameter in the problem. The theta angle can be removed. So we don't, I'm not going to talk about the theta angle ever again. The phase diagram of this model is a function of a complex mass. So this theory does not have center vortices. There are no twisted fluxes like Toof did. So what am I, uh, why, why is any of what I'm saying useful? It's useful because when the quarks decouple, you recover the physics of pure Young-Mills theory. And this leads to far-reaching conclusions, as you'll see. So when the mass is real, the theory has time reversal symmetry. So in this two-dimensional phase diagram, which is a complex mass, on the real axis, there is time reversal symmetry. When the mass is huge and positive, it's Young-Mills theory at vanishing theta. When the mass is huge and negative, it's Young-Mills theory at theta equals pi, which are the two time reversal invariant points. So we saw that when theta is equal to pi, it's very reasonable to conjecture that there are two vacua. It actually follows from this anomaly. The, the jump in the counter term that I talked about. So that means that one flavor QCD at large negative mass has two vacua because uh, it's, it's the same symmetry breaking that we discussed in pure Young-Mills theory. But at large positive mass, there is one vacuum because it's just pure Young-Mills theory at theta equals zero. So we believe there is one non-degenerate confined vacuum. Only this fact by itself means that there is a line of first order transitions that has to terminate already in one flavor QCD. Because there is a line where there is a two-fold degeneracy, but once you go around, uh, once you go above or below, there is only one ground state. And also here, there is one ground state. So only this fact by itself implies that there is a massless point in one flavor QCD. Usually people say that one flavor QCD does not have a chiral Lagrangian. This is wrong. There is one point where there is a massless pseudoscalar. I'll call it eta prime for suggestive reasons. This actually is weird because the eta prime is never massless. Eta prime is never a, eta prime is never a massless particle in a higher, in when the number of flavors is two or three or four. But when the number of flavors is exactly one, the eta prime becomes exactly massless at some special point, which I'll call minus m naught. It's not when the capital M is zero. Capital M equals zero is just nothing. It's not special in any way. There is just nothing there. Igor mentioned yesterday that the same thing happens in the Schwinger model with one flavor, that, it, uh, that there is a point where there is an Ising transition. And this is now seen in Monte Carlo. The same sh we say that the same should happen in one flavor QCD, but it's not been seen in Monte Carlo yet. There should be a massless point in one flavor QCD with a chiral Lagrangian that we conjecture to be just a quartic interacting eta prime particle. On this side, there are two vacua. 
on this side there, are, there is one vacuum. So uh, the point m equals zero, when people discuss the solution of the CP problem by saying that one quark could be massless, you can think about this toy model, one flavor QCD. Clearly this is just nonsense. There is just nothing there. Saying that you wanna tune the model to be here is as good as tuning the model to be here or as good as tuning the model to be here. You just wanna be somewhere on a line, on the real line where there is CP symmetry. There is just no sense in which m equals zero is anything to talk about. Yes? Yes, it's false. It's false. You see it's false. I gave you a proof that there is a, mass, there is a massless point in one flavor QCD, and we call this massless, massless particle eta prime. I don't know. There is no such thing as m equals to zero. There is a first order line that terminates. It terminates at a second order point and the massless particle is called eta prime. That's it. But zero is just nothing. There is nothing at zero, nothing to discuss. It doesn't solve the theta angle problem. It doesn't solve the CP problem. It's just a random point to the right, for you to the right of this blue dot. Blue dot. It's a massless particle yeah. that uh, is gap, okay, gapless particle at some special point in the phase diagram of one flavor QCD. It's a pseudoscalar. Mm -hmm. Why is it a pseudoscalar? Because if you go to this side of the phase diagram, there are two vacuo related by time reversal symmetry. So it has to be a pseudoscalar. Maybe at that point there are 17 more massless particles. I don't know. Mm -hmm. This is just the minimal conjecture. Yeah, but what, what about spin one half particle? It disappears? Which spin half? One flavor, QCD. One flavor is a spin one, uh, which is flavor, termion. Termion, yes. Right, uh, so not, not, not pseudoscalar. Yes. Right. The bilinear is a pseudoscalar. Yeah. You mean that, that, that this uh, spin one half uh, stuff is, is, uh, is confined, or what, what, what happened to... to uh, yeah, you can say it's confined. You can say it's confined if you want. Yeah. I think Thomas's talk will be about the subtle distinction between confined and Higgs. Yeah, yeah. You can say it's confined, you can say it's Higgs, I don't know, it doesn't matter. But, uh, can you see this massless particle as uh, the uh, constellation between the, the anomaly and the mass? Yeah, except that if you do it in the Cairo Lagrangian that you explained, yeah. it's never massless. I don't know if you know, you probably know this fact, but. If you try to scan the phase diagram of QCD, let's say with two flavors in large N, there is never a point where the uh, large N, finite N, it doesn't matter. There is never a point where eta prime is massless. But with one flavor there is? Well, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. With one flavor, it's the only case where eta prime becomes massless. Yeah. At large N, you can understand it as a cancellation of your instant on induced effect and the three level quark current algebra mass. Yeah. At the boundary of the Dachshund phase, yeah. Yeah, at the boundary of the phase diagram. Uh, yeah, it's pi, yeah, in that, sorry, in, that, in the diagram that you drew, it's pi naught, it's not at a prime. In, uh, they mix, but there is one massive one. Yeah, but one of them is massive, one is light, so. It's a question of basis. Anyway, I'm not, I, I'm just, I just, this is the phase diagram of one flavor QCD. There is a point where eta prime is massless. You can investigate the physics around this point by small perturbation of this quartic Lagrangian. There is actually logarithmic running of this quartic coupling because it's just phi to the four in four dimensions. And there is a domain wall here. There is no domain wall here because there is one vacuum. Actually, the phase diagram of one flavor QCD is slightly more complicated. There's one more thing that I haven't told you, which is the, about the domain walls. So this is just a quartic theory of a scalar. And if you go slightly to the left, there are two vacua, and the domain wall is just the same, it's kink. It's a kink in phi to the four theory between phi equals minus one and phi equals plus one. It's a completely empty interface. But remember that when we go to very large negative mass, 
the interface, I argued, is an abelian quantum whole state. Because abelian quantum whole states are very stable phases of matter. That's why they're interesting in condensed matter. You cannot destabilize them. So at least for very large negative mass, it has to be a U1 level N, a billion quantum whole state. So we see that actually the phase diagram of one flavor QCD has one more special point on this black line. And I don't know if there is such a point in one, sh Schwinger, one flavor Schwinger model. I have to think about it. There is one more special point where there is nothing in the bulk. There is no phase transition in the bulk. But there is a jump in the theory on the interface. And it jumps from being U1 level N a billion quantum whole state here to a trivial interface here. And there is a three-dimensional model or a two plus one dimensional model that models the phase transition on the domain wall. It's an effective filter not in the bulk, but on the domain wall that is a, basically a churn simons theory coupled to a boson. The boson represents the fractional spin quark. And it goes from a Higgs phase to a confined phase. And maybe Thomas will tell us more about the distinction between these two phases. But there is a phase transition here from an abelian quantum whole state to a trivial phase. So there are two special points in the phase diagram. One is very easy to see, and the other involves looking at interfaces. OK. Uh, I'm done with the 3 plus 1 dimensional story. I wanted to tell you about some applications of these ideas of truth vortices in 1 plus 1. And that's it. So this is a. Uh, a completely different subject, uh, it, but it goes back to some work of David, who is in the audience, and Igor, who is in the audience, and uh, Smilga, whom we mentioned yesterday. So uh, it's the application of the same idea that I told you, but in two-dimensional QCD with one adjoined uh, quark. I'll go very quickly over this because it's a little technical. So at this, in this theory, the massless point is well-defined, unlike one flavor QCD, because there is a Z2 axial symmetry. And also, for all values of the mass, there, is, there are center vortices. So this theory has a center, and there are center vortices. Also, this theory has marginal operators, which are quartics in the, in the adjoint fermion that were not considered in the 90s, at least not seriously. You can just put them to zero. It's completely consistent. But in principle, if this model were to come from some lattice simulation, it would probably generate some quartics. So it would be nice to know what they do. They're marginal. So as before, you can study Toft vortices, and you can study uh, and you can study this counter term, and the fantastic discovery of the last couple of years. And you can find a very beautiful proof in this paper of Chairman Tanizaki and Unsel is that if you perform a Z2 transformation, the counter term jumps by n over 2. So let me put it in words. The system has a Z2 symmetry at the massless point. But in the presence of a toothed vortices, it does not have Z2 symmetry. I don't know if it was known in the 90s. I don't think so. But in the presence of a toothed vortices, this Z2 symmetry is violated. The counter term jumps by n over 2. And it has far-reaching consequences, similar to what I told you in uh, 3 plus 1 dimensions. So what are the consequences? First of all, it implies that the Wilson line with n over 2 boxes, so it's some high representation, is always deconfined with arbitrary marginal couplings O1 and O2. So this is a new conclusion. So pr pr probe quarks with n over 2 boxes are always deconfined. And the Z2 symmetry is always spontaneously broken. That's another very interesting conclusion. This is at the massless theory. In the massive theory, there is confinement and the symmetry is restored, where it's explicitly broken, I'm sorry. Uh, now, I'll tell you about a more recent conclusion about this model, which is much stronger. And it concerns the model where the operators O1 and 2, the quartics, are not included. It turns out that this model has a ton of symmetries that were not observed before, exponentially many symmetries, 4 to the n. And these symmetries lead to some very interesting conclusions. First of all, this model has an exponential number of vacua. This, is not, this was not known before. An exponential number of degenerate ground states. And actually, this model has a zero temperature, a Hagedorn transition already at zero temperature because of this huge degeneracy. So the, model, the massless model has an exponential large, exponential degeneracy of vacua. Uh, it has many exotic symmetries. And also, these new symmetries allow to compute the string tension rigorously. And I think it's the only QCD-like theory 
where, um, well, without supersymmetry, where the string tension was computed analytically. Uh, this was possible only because of these exotic symmetries, the 4 to the n exotic symmetries. So this is the formula that uh, we obtained for the string tension for k strings. Actually, people obtain such sign formulas for the string tension in some toy models of QCD, like in the work of Chris and Igor. And also, amusingly, in the work of uh, Adi Armoni, Daniele Dorigoni, and Gabriele Veneziano, they obtained such a formula in the Noguchi Kawai reduction. I don't know why these toy models give the same answer, but here it was a rigorous computation using these exponentially many symmetries. So the conclusion, let me just uh, sum up. What is the conclusion about this model? Uh, just to be clear. With quartic couplings, with quartic couplings, it's confined except for one very special representation, which has n over two boxes at the massless point. Without quartic couplings, it has a huge vacuum degeneracy, complete deconfinement, and you can do many computations thanks to the exponentially many symmetries. So this is the conclusion. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to explain that. I'll tell you the story mathematically. I don't know how to explain it intuitively. This model has an exponentially large amount of symmetries that you cannot see with the naked eye. The only symmetry that you see with the naked eye is this Z2 that you knew about in the 90s. But actually, it has many, many, many others that you cannot write explicitly or understand very intuitively. And we studied the algebra of these uh, symmetries, and we found the smallest representation. The vacuum has to be in some representation of this symmetry. And these symmetries are exotic. They don't admit a trivial representation. And 2 to the n was the smallest representation that we found. We looked for these representations on the computer for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we got to 7. And it was growing exponentially. And we just fit it with 2 to the n. You see, uh, when you have this, a lot of degeneracy, I, in the limit, I would say, aha, it's a, like a Gaussian particle. You know? No, no, it's this, the, no. they are separated, oh, by, the they are separated right? by finite tension domain walls. I see. And they are not nearby in any sense, even yeah, at large so n. Even at large n, they're like just a huge uh, value of many ground states. Okay. They're not coming close to each other. Thanks. This is the result of your paper a couple of years ago. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot.